Okay, um, welcome to the spring semester of the colloquium, everybody. This is the first colloquium of the spring semester, and we're happy to have our speaker, whose name I am going to pronounce with a heavy English accent, and it will not be anything like it's supposed to sound. So in English, I will say Marco Tulio Ribeiro. And when he starts his talk, he will pronounce his name properly because I know that we have real Portuguese speakers here. Um, Marco got his PhD from the University of Washington, and he's now a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Um, he's going to talk to us about detection and analysis of bugs in NLP models. And what I'm really looking forward to is he promises to show us some fun bugs that he discovered using his methodology. So, uh, Marco, if you would like to start and say your name properly, <laughs> uh, please yeah. go ahead. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, Marco Tulio Ribeiro is how you would say my name. I typically don't even try asking people to do that. It's too painful. Um, yeah, so detection and analysis of bugs in NLP models is just a title for a collection of things I'm going to pull from different papers, in particular two papers from ACL. We're going to start with analysis. Um, so I'm mostly pulling from this paper at ACL 2019 with a few UW collaborators. Um, <clears throat> so we have this paper called Eridite. So just for this part of the talk, I'm going to use as a running example um, question answering, either the kind where you have a paragraph and you ask a question, you have to extract the answer from the paragraph, like squad or stuff like that, or visual question answering where you have an image, you ask a question, and you get an answer from a model. Now, everything in, I'm going to be talking about is general, like it should work for any task, but we just use um, question answering as the running example. Um, so if you're trying to evaluate NLP systems in general, but um, in particular, if you think of these um, systems where we have a lot of data, like question answering, for example, what a lot of people do is to look at aggregate metrics. So you want to ask, how good is my model at answering questions? I don't know, measure accuracy or F1 or some other metric like that. And that gives you a summary. So 62%, that's maybe not great. Um, but what about the rest? Like you don't really get an accurate understanding of what's going on if I just give you an accuracy number. Um, typically you want to understand what's going on when you're not right. Um, so one thing that people do in question answering is to split either the questions or the, um, to split the data either by question type or answer type. In this case, you're splitting by um, in question type, oh, sorry, answer type whether it's yes or no, whether it's a number or other. So this gives you, gives you a little better understanding. Um, it's saying that the model is better at yes or no questions, it's really bad at number of questions and good at others, but it's still pretty coarse. Um, so how do you really understand your model's mistakes? When I took an NLP class back in 2012 or something, um, I, was listening to, I was looking at the Stanford NLP class online and what I learned is that what you should be doing is error analysis. Um, and it goes something like this. Um, you look at a hundred mistakes and try to see if there's any patterns of what's going on. Um, so this is not only in NLP courses, it also happens in a bunch of papers, which is a good practice. Like people should be looking at incorrect um, predictions and figuring out what's going on. But this is a common practice that people do. Just look at random failure modes or between 50 and 100, we actually surveyed, I think, 12 papers and all of them were within this range. Um, so let's try, let's try this approach and see what happens. Let's do traditional error analysis. So here's an image, um, here's a question, real question from the VQA data set. How many sausages are on the grill? The answer is that the model gives back is two. There's obviously more than two sausages. So you look at this example, you may be thinking, hmm, maybe the model is bad at counting maybe it doesn't know what a sausage is, um, maybe it's bad at counting when there's large quantities of things. So maybe you um, put that somewhere, put this thought somewhere, just label it as a counting mistake and move on. Next example out of 100. 
a few people. How many people are wearing black? Two, again. So this is counting again, accident. Luckily, we came up with this. Maybe it doesn't know what a color is. Maybe it always answers two. Um, so as you can see, this process, I don't even know how people are able to do it because it takes forever and it's really hard to categorize mistakes. If you just go looking at random examples, you start with a hypothesis and then you change it midway, but then you don't go back to the first 10 examples you looked at. In this case, I actually think that the, this model answers two with a frequency that is not warranted. So this is the best hypothesis, um, but you wouldn't know that just from looking at 100 random examples. So the problem with this error analysis, this traditional approach is that you take a small sample, you only look at mistakes, so it's biased. So maybe you look at a few mistakes and you think, oh, the model is terrible at counting, but actually there's a ton of counting questions and the model is pretty good. Um, also, you don't really test the hypothesis. So I just listed five hypotheses here for what's going on in two instances, and I didn't really test any of them. I just said, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and you're not actually verifying whether the model is behaving according to what you're thinking. And the other problem is that the labels are subjective. Um, so I said, maybe it doesn't know colors, or maybe it doesn't know um, when there's a large quantity. What's a large quantity? More than two, more than five, more than 10? Um, so it's hard to compare analysis from one paper to another. So we, we propose an approach and also a tool that we call Erudite. Um, it's not misspelled, that's how we decided to spell it. But basically in a nutshell, we're saying, let's just do two things. One, let's group the data with precise descriptors. So this just means let's use code rather than subjective things to group our data. And if you think about structured data, like um, if you had a model predicting income and you ask, how good is our model when people older than 20? You just run a SQL query and you solve that problem. For NLP, it's not that easy. Um, if you ask, for example, how good is our model in questions about people? Um, now you need, or questions that require color understanding or something. Now you need a parser, now you need NER. Um, now you need to basically maybe train a model to figure out whether the question is about people or not. Um, so it's not as easy to write this descriptors. But we're saying we should try to do it and we, develop a, a DSL to help people do it. So I'll talk more about it later. Actually, I'll talk more about it now. Um, so here's in question answering, there's this hypothesis that was floating around when we wrote this paper um, for a particular model that said, hey, models get distracted. So you have a question about a type of entity, like a who question you expect the answer to be a person. And in this case, the model does make a mistake. Um, if you read the paragraph, you don't have to read it, but Murray Gold um, is the right answer. Murray Gold provided the 2000, created the 2005 team. That's ground truth. And the model predicted John Devney. So the hypothesis says, look, the model is really good at um, figuring out the entity type. It knows that it's, it's expecting a person when you ask who, but it gets distracted. It, if you have multiple people in the paragraph, it's just gonna pick one or it's gonna get distracted. So this is a hypothesis that a lot of people had, like we interviewed experts and they thought this is a thing for this particular model at the time. Um, this is how we would go about testing that hypothesis with our DSL. It's a little, it's a bit of a complicated query, but I think it illustrates the kind of things that we're saying people should do. So here we're saying the entity of the ground truth is not empty. So Inside the DSL, we're assuming you ran an NER system and we just use Spacey. It's good enough that you can run queries like this and get decent, very good results. So we're saying the entity must not be empty. In this case, it's person, entity of the ground truth. This second line is saying, if you count the number of people in the paragraph, that has to be more than the number of people in the ground truth. So if the ground truth answer has one person in the paragraph also has one person, there's no possibility of getting distracted. You just have to match the entity type. So in this case, this would fall. So this is potential distractors. And then we're saying the model got the correct entity type. So remember the hypothesis says the model is good at matching entities, but bad at figuring out which entity it is. So this is saying the model matched the entity. And then finally we're saying F1 is zero. So the model picked the wrong answer. This precise query would give you the, the, 
the, all the data or situations when the model got distracted. You may not agree with my definition of distracted, but at least you can check it and you can replicate it. So this is what we get on squad if we run this. I'm gonna run one line at a time. At a time. So if you look at all of the validation data, um, I'm showing correct and incorrect. So 68% exact match. Um, if you look at ant, uh, questions where the ground truth answer is not empty, um, accuracy goes up to 80%. So it's easier when the, the answer is a person. If you look of when you have potential distractors, um, accuracy drops by 1%. So it doesn't seem like having potential distractors makes a big difference. And then if you further filter by examples where the model got the correct entity, accuracy actually goes up. Um, so if you think about it, given that the model predicted the correct entity, it's more likely to predict the right thing than if it didn't. And then finally, if you look just at, at mistakes, of course, the, the rate is 100%, but that's a vast minority of examples. So it doesn't seem like the distraction hypothesis is a reasonable one. The point, though, is not to test the distraction hypothesis, to say, if we have a hypothesis, let's test it in a precise way, in a way that can be replicated. Um, so we, we think that the DSL really helps with this. And then the second idea in the approach we're proposing is to do counterfactual analysis. So let, let's get back to our distractor example. Um, we're saying the model is getting distracted. One way to check if the distractor really is the problem is to erase it. So I go to the paragraph. If the model predicted John Dabney, I just replace that with some random token that's not going to get predicted um, unless the model has issues. So I replace it with that token, and then I get a new prediction. Um, unfortunately, the model is wrong again. But I can measure how often does it change to another wrong prediction, how often does it change to the right thing, and how often does it stay the same. So when it stays the same, clearly the distraction is not a problem. It's not the fact that there are other entities of the same type. Even if you have a non-entity, the model is still predicting that span. So it's either using a heuristic, like predict the beginning of the sentence, or it's looking at the rest of the sentence and saying a person should be here or something. And we can quantify this. So actually doing this analysis when possible allows you to tease out what the problems are. So 48%, we can reasonably claim um, that in the 48% where it changes to correct, it may be a case of distraction um, as the hypothesis is originally framed. Um, so here's a demo. We have a tool. It's a cool visualization tool. There's a lot going on here. I explain. So this is it for VQA. Um, on the left, we, we let you add a bunch of models if you want to compare different models. So this is doing VQA. Um, in the middle, we have what we call an instance browser. So you can look at different instances without any querying or as you query things. So for VQA, um, it's showing the ground truth and the prediction for each of the models. So the first example, there's a question, is there any fruit on this tree? The answer is no. Um, it's time stamp because this data is that they collect labels from 10 different people in Mechanical Turk, and we're displaying those labels here. And then both models get this correct. On the left, we have attributes. Um, I didn't really talk about this, but the DSL allows you to define attributes and see statistics. So in this case, it's saying answer type of the ground truth. It's either other, yes or no, or number. And you could get this with traditional analysis without erudite too, but it's just nice that it shows you for every question type what you have. So this, this is part of the DSL. Uh, again, orange is mistakes and blue is examples that are predicted correct. And if you look at this, the minority of examples are in the category number, but that seems to be where our largest error rates are. So you can click that and take a look at that and explore. So you notice that I clicked on it and it added a query so it's saying answer type is number. Those are pre-computed. Um, and if you look at a few of the examples, um, sorry, before you look at examples, it's giving you statistics like in this, this slice of the data is 12% of the data, 12% of the data set. And the error rate is 59%. Um, and this gives you almost, this gives you 19% of all errors. 19% so of all model errors are when the answer type is number. So let's add an attribute here. Since we're looking at numbers, um, let's look at the ground truth numbers. And this is the kind of thing that the DSL lets you do. We're going to digitize them. So we're going to say if the answer is a number, just digitize them um, or bin them. Um, so it's binning them 
from one to five, and then it creates one bin from five to 10. And again, the DSL lets you add this as an attribute and you can look at it. And if you look at this, you see an interesting pattern. Um, the error rate is kind of roughly um, constant up to five, but as you get more than five, the error rate goes up by a lot. So all of those orange examples are mistakes. And I created the attribute. If I click on that, we're gonna add that to our current query. So now, since I'm looking at examples where the ground truth number is more than five, on the left, it's been updated. So we only have examples that are numbers, ground truth greater than five. Um, this is now error rate of this slice is 89%. So this seems to be a problem. This model cannot count when, does not seem to be able to count when the answer is more than five. Um, if we look at the attribute we created before, now it bins them in smaller bins. And it seems that if you do more than 10, more or equal to 10, their rate is even higher. So it's 95%. And you may want to take a look at what that is. So looking at the instance browser, um, you look at the first example, it's asking the model to do OCR. So this is not really counting. Um, second example, same thing. And so you may think, hmm, I wonder if there's a lot of OCR questions in this data set. So if you click on number, it gives you um, suggestions for what you add to your query. And in this case, we're gonna add to the query the, a filter that says the word number has to be in the question. So this same pattern has number in the question. And now if you look at the examples, it's basically only OCR. You can inspect them. And all of the examples are asking the model to do OCR. Now this is a visual question answering data set. Um, this slice is half of a percent of the whole data set. I don't expect that a VQA model is going to learn to do OCR. So I basically don't care about this slice. This is 1% of all errors and this is a slice that I don't care about. So you can save that slice and say, this is a question that the model is asked to do OCR. And you can do a bunch of other things with this groups that you create, you can share them and so on. But the point of this was just to give you a, a feeling, like just a feel of how you go about doing this analysis. It's more fun than looking at um, a bunch of random examples too, because you formulate this hypothesis and you go and check them and you learn more both about the model and the data. So here's another insight that we got. Um, I've never actually seen this discussed. I've read a bunch of VQA papers, maybe they discussed it, but I didn't see this discussed before I played with the tool. So for a lot of questions, um, you have, the question seems easier. So yes or no questions, what color is this? But some questions are way more ambiguous. And you can see that by looking at how many ground truth answers that is. So if you ask a human to answer the, the question, you get 10 different answers. Um, or if you get this in the second one, why are the four cupcakes different? So you get, again, eight different answers, in this case, seven different answers. And if you look at the VQA data set, questions on the left have the same weight as questions on the right. So if humans can agree, it's hard to expect a model to do well. So if we create a slice here, so I'm actually creating a category here that says how many ground truth, how many different answers do we get when you ask 10 people on Mechanical Turk? And if you, between six and 10 answers, the model pretty much doesn't get it. Um, and this is 13.6% of the data set. Almost a third of all of the errors of this particular model are in examples where humans can agree. So basically, I, I personally also don't care about the slice of the data set. But if you read VQA papers and you're comparing accuracy, this is going to be influencing that um, across the board. So anyway, um, we did a user study where we had people who are experts play with this tool. Um, so we had 10 participants, PhD students in NLP, um, or people in industry. Industry here is AI too, so it's a research lab um, working on question answering. So we had them evaluate, or we had them play with a standard model at the time, um, which was by from scratch, standard baseline, I guess. Um, and we asked them to replicate traditional error analysis. So the by paper, this is a model that was used as a baseline. Um, in their paper, they do the traditional form of error analysis, where they look at 50 or 100 instances and they categorize them. So we ask our users to replicate that because once they replicate it in our tool, we can compare their analysis one to the other. And then we ask them to play with the tool. So here's the replication. We ask them to look at the description from the original paper. You don't have to read it, 
but the original paper had this category that had like half of their mistakes, which says imprecise error boundaries. Um, and they have a few examples. So we asked users to replicate that in our DSL. And then we asked them, how close do you think your group matches the paper? Basically, how good do you think you approximated this? And people were pretty confident that they, they did the same thing that the paper was trying to do. So on a rate scale of one to five, they thought they were pretty close. But once we compared the results, this is what we got. And what we're measuring here is the percentage of errors that they covered with their query for this particular phenomenon. If you remember, the paper had about 50% of the errors fall into this category. And here we have something between 15 and 45%. So a lot of variance, which just indicates that traditional error analysis, if you don't make it precise, um, it won't be precise, basically. People will not be consistent and there's no way to compare analysis if you do things like this. So here's just a few examples. One user said, imprecise error boundaries means that the model is off by at most two tokens. Another user said, oh, it just needs to have high answer overlap. Um, so if you look at the tokens, I want that overlap to be more than a certain threshold. So obviously these give you very different errors, very different slices, and um, it's good to make things precise, I guess is the point. In terms of exploration, we ask people to um, measure whether they got new insights or whether they were able to confirm or reject their hypothesis. And people in general, I guess the summary here is that they really liked it. They thought that they found important um, insights, that it was easy to use, and so on. So in summary, this paper is very much an HCI paper where we have this tool and process. Um, but I think it's pretty applicable to NLP tests in general. And, we have these two ideas, or precise grouping and counterfactual analysis. I know I didn't say much about the counterfactual analysis, but I'll say a little bit more in a second. But we're claiming that if you do precise analysis, you can, you, you can have reproducibility. So you can replicate analysis, you can take a new model from the same analysis, and it scales. Like once you did it, once you have the queries, you can just run it again, rather than having to look at 50 new or 100 new mistakes every time. And we have this tool, nice visualization. You can do it interactively, it's fun. And we did a user study um, and people like it. So basically this is, a, this is a project in 2019 that I really liked. Um, I thought it would be of interest to you guys and it's open source, you can try it out. Um, Tong Chong is still maintaining it, I think. So, so moving on, this is Coast paper. This is way after, this is actually a paper that we wrote now and it's on archive. But so we have this new paper on, it's not actually on analysis or anything. It's just on generating counterfactuals um, through a model, but it's so helpful for error analysis that I thought I'll just plug it in here. So we have this model. I'm not gonna tell you about it, how we get it. I'm just gonna tell you, we have this model, we call it Polyjuice. And what it does is given a sentence, it produces a set of counterfactuals. So if you have a sentence like, it is great for kids, it's gonna give you, it is great, it is not great for kids, it is great for no one, it is great for adults, it is scary for kids. Just a general purpose set of perturbations that are still close to the original example, which is what we're calling counterfactual. And it also has um, some level of control. So you can say, please delete stuff, please add negation, please do lexical and stuff. And we have a bunch of uses for this, um, but in terms of analysis, it really makes it easier to do counterfactual analysis. In the erudite paper, we the only kind of counterfactual analysis we really allowed was um, basically regular expressions on the DSL. So you could write rules that replace stuff. But with this, you can do a kind of analysis that you couldn't do before. Um, so for example, sorry to switch examples in the middle of the talk, but now this is NLI. Um, you have a premise and a hypothesis and you wanna predict um, if the premise um, entails the hypothesis, or if it's neutral, or if it's a contradiction. Um, so the premise here is the woman is holding a baby by a window. Hypothesis, this woman is looking out the window. The model here is Roberta predicts neutral, which actually is the ground truth here. Um, so if we use polyjuice, which I didn't tell you anything about, but if we say, please give me negation on this example. So perturb the hypothesis and give me negations. It gives you stuff like this. So it gives you no woman is looking out the window. This woman isn't looking out the window. This woman is not looking out the window. And it's interesting that in this case, um, this woman isn't looking out the window and this woman is not looking out the window, get different predictions. Um, one gets contradiction, other gets neutral. So 
in order to explore this in the data set, um, if you have a generator like this, one thing you can do is say, look, give me all of the neutral examples, examples that are predicted as neutral, and add negation to them and see what happens. So this is counterfactual analysis on a different scale. So that's exactly what we're doing here, and you have templates. So whenever you see a neutral example, where Polyjuice is trying to add negation, and you can extract templates like, did I add not? Did I add the word um, not with an apostrophe? So the, did I did I change the determiner to no? Like no woman is looking out the window. And so, on. and then we can compute um, how many examples are fit in those templates and what happened to the prediction. So what we're measuring here is how often did the prediction go from neutral to contradiction. And this was actually trying to test a hypothesis that people say these models are biased. If you have negation, they tend to break contradiction. We think that is the case. But what's interesting here is we started with an example and we thought, hmm, maybe it doesn't do contractions well. Let me test that at scale. And we found that actually, if you contract the not um, it doesn't make much difference in most cases. Um, the model goes from negation to contradiction roughly with the same frequency. If you start a sentence with no, though, um, it almost always predicts negation, no matter what it is, no matter if it breaks in neutral before. So this is an interesting pattern that we found. And you can do this because we have a model that allows you this kind of control that says add negation or replace um, antonyms or whatever. Um, we have this targeted perturbation. So it's a step beyond just having um, regular expressions. So here's another example. Instead of perturbing with a control tag, we're just saying perturb the subject. So instead of saying this woman um, is looking out the window, we're saying um, blank is looking out the window. And we get different um, examples. So here the model chose, we didn't, we're not trying to um, think about quantifiers at all, but this is what we got um, when we try to perturb this, and it perturbs it by saying two women are looking out the window, ten women are looking out the window, and again we see an interesting pattern. Um, if two, looking, two women are looking out the window is neutral, certainly ten women looking out the window should also be neutral. Um, everything should be neutral actually in this case. Um, so in this case we ran more analysis, the model can't count, it relies on heuristics. So if you have um, it relies on heuristics. I'm telling you, you have to believe me, but I can share my analysis. But if, if you have the same number on the premise and the hypothesis, it's pretty good. If you have different numbers, if you have two and three, it's pretty good at saying contradiction. That's a heuristic. Sometimes it's not contradiction. But if you, if you require counting, like if you have a boy and a girl do something, and then you change two to three, it doesn't care. Um, if you change two to ten, it doesn't care. So it doesn't actually count. It relies on heuristics. The point, though, is not these examples. It's just that there are ways of doing the kind of counterfactual analysis I was talking about before that are better now than what we had when we originally wrote the paper. So this is an area I'm particularly excited about, this kind of analysis. So this was just a little teaser. I'm, not, I'm actually not going to talk about this paper. Um, I'm going to talk about this other paper that we had at ACL 2020. You notice it's a different set of collaborators, but it's, again, people from UW and UCI. Um, so this paper, Beyond Accuracy Behavior Testing of NLP Models and Checklist. Let me just check how I'm doing on time. So let me start with this other paper where I said we're doing detection and analysis, I think. Um, this is detection, detecting bugs, um, actually testing for bugs. So the question we're trying to answer in this paper is, how do I check if my model works? I just said um, you can measure accuracy, I guess. you can do this kind of analysis. But even before this kind of analysis where you're trying to understand errors, how do you know if something works in the sense of like, let's say I train a model, I call it Oscar. When I, when I, when I, did, the, when I did this, there was no um, large language model called Oscar. I think there probably is one by now. But let's say I train a model, I write a paper, send it to ACL. It does well on benchmarks. How do I know if it works enough that I should go ahead and replace my doctor? Um, for diagnosis, for example. Or more realistically, if I'm at a company, like I am at Microsoft, um, should I just go ahead and use Oscar in our products? And this is a problem that, this is a question that people have all the time. Like we have this big models coming out all the time. Should we go ahead and use them? Does performance on benchmark actually mean that they're gonna work? Um, and we know that there's many problems with accuracy. There's shortcuts that you can take. Um, if you have specific benchmarks, you can overfit to those benchmarks. You can learn things that are useful in those benchmarks, but do not generalize and so on. 
So what do you do? I think we as a community in NLP, what we've done, one thing that we've done is to write more papers. So we write a bunch of analysis papers. So you have Oscar or let's say you have Bert and then you write a paper saying Bert does X, Y, and Z. Bert doesn't work for this. Bert can't do conjunction and whatnot. So we write a flurry of papers analyzing these models and figuring out when they work and when they don't work. Um, and this is great. I've actually, I can say, I guess I'm guilty of writing those papers as well. I'm not guilty. These are good papers, but it's a lot of work. Um, there's no way that you can do this kind of analysis on a day-to-day -day when you're at a company figuring out, do I use this model or not? So in this paper, we were saying, let's do something else in addition to what we've been doing. Let's just test NLP models, just like we test software. We have this tradition of testing software. We know what we're doing there, roughly. Like, it, testing is good. We've seen that that works. Why don't we test NLP models as well? So we're trying to borrow principles from software engineering and apply them to NLP. The translation is not immediate all the time, but there's some very useful principles that I think we can, we can borrow. So one principle is saying, let's test small units. Um, and this is precisely the opposite of what we do in NLP, I guess. Um, what we do is, here's this test set with 200,000 examples. Tell me the accuracy. Um, or at most, you do some sort of analysis like what I was describing before. So. In software, testing small units is easier because you have typically access to the code. You can just go and test a unit, or sorry, go and test a function or something. In NLP, it's a safe assumption that we're not, well, it's a good assumption that models are complex and sometimes even black boxes. So you can't go around testing individual units, especially if you have this large neural networks. So we're saying in NLP, one way to apply this principle is to test different linguistic capabilities. And, I shudder to use the word linguistic um, with you guys, but that's what we think in the paper. What I mean by linguistic capabilities is stuff like, does my model have a good vocabulary? Can my model handle different parts of speech? Can my model handle named entities? Can my model handle negation and so on? Um, so I'm saying let's test those things individually rather than just having a data set or in addition to having a data set with a bunch of examples. So there's a principle from software engineering and behavioral testing that's saying, let's decouple tests from implementation. And again, in NLP, I think we typically don't do this very well because what we do is we, in general, I'm generalizing here, but we collect a data set and then we split it into training, validation, and testing. And that means that any biases that we have in the data collection or any problems in labeling or, or whatnot are going to be the same in training and test data. And that's actually a source of a lot of the problems we see, I think. So here we're saying, let's decouple tests from training. Let's not just use the training data or data similar to the training data to test. And they were going to test these models. Is we're going to test behaviors with different test types. So we're actually going to be proposing a matrix here where the rows are capabilities and columns are test types. We have three different te test types to start, but of course you can do more. So one test type is analogous to a unit test where you just have known inputs and outputs. So we're calling this a minimum functionality test. I guess we could have called it a unit test, but this just emphasizes that we're saying, hey, we're not really checking if the model can do vocabulary. We just want to know if it has the minimum vocabulary sufficient for us to say it, it, it can function. So for example, if we're doing sentiment analysis, um, here's how I would write a minimum functionality test. Just have very simple examples where you have very sentiment-laden adjectives. This is a great flight or verbs. I hate this airline. I like the seat. These should be easy. If your sentiment analysis model cannot figure out, I hate this airline, you have a problem. So maybe you collect 500 of those and then you have a test and you can say, does my model work for this basic unit test? If we're testing negation, we'll basically do the same thing, but add different forms of negation. So we'll say, the pilot wasn't nice, I didn't love this movie, um, and so on. So different forms of negation. No one loved this, and whatever, whatever. So that's an MFT. For the other two tests, we're borrowing from this um, type of test in software engineering called metamorphic testing, and also from property-based testing. Metamorphic testing is basically saying, let's apply a perturbation to the input, and then measure something about what happens. And property-based testing is saying, Maybe we don't know what the right answer is, but we can measure a property of the answer. So for example, we have this type of test that we call invariance tests, where basically we're measuring invariance. Um, so we apply a perturbation that we expect should not change predictions, just like what I was 
showing before us the counterfactual analysis, or maybe I shouldn't call it counterfactuals. But just as I was showing before, if you have a if you have a perturbation that should be should not change predictions, you can test that as an invariant. So for sentiment analysis, for example, I think a reasonable one is changing location names. If you have, for example, if you're doing Twitter sentiment analysis, and you have a tweet that you think is positive, and then I change Chicago to Dallas, it should not become negative. Or if I change Brazil to Turkey, it should not really change sentiment because location names don't really carry sentiment for the most part. Um, another type of test is what we're calling a directional expectation test. And it's the same thing, but we don't expect invariance, we expect something else. So this is a catch-all for different types of properties that you may expect. So here's an example for sentiment analysis. If you take a tweet and add something very negative to the end of it, um, whatever tweet was, I add, I hate you, you're lame, and so on. I think it's a reasonable expectation that sentiment should not become more positive. I'm not saying it shouldn't become, I'm not saying it has to become negative. Maybe those balance out and so I'm just saying, if I add, I hate you, it should not become more positive. So that's the kind of direction expectation test. I'll have plenty more examples in the paper. So checklist, which is the process that we're proposing, is basically just filling this matrix up. This matrix gives guidance as to what people should be testing and how. And you basically go cell by cell, figuring out, can I write a test for this? Can I write a test for this? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And then you can test your model. Um, I did say that sometimes for a single test, you want to write 500 examples. That's a lot of work. So we provide a bunch of tooling to make that process easier. So we have this templating tooling where, for example, if you have, this is a good movie, you generalize that into this is a blank movie and you get suggestions like that you can just click rather than having to imagine. So we're using a math language model for this. Um, and this really, really helps scale individual examples out into templates, um, which makes it easier to get coverage. We have a bunch of lexicons, um, like person names, most common person names, person names for different um, locations, different languages, location names, like the most popular cities in every country in the world and so on. So we have a bunch of lexicons that we think people um, come back to again and again for writing tests and I'm still adding more. We have a perturbation library with simple functions like add negation or is there a negation in this um, example or not and so on. And we have visualizations and we have, the summary here is we have a bunch of tooling and I'm actively working on that tooling still, um, even post paper, so provide tools. Here's an example of a visualization where you have the matrix of tests and you can click on a row and you have a bunch of tests there and you can click on a test and you can see specific examples, you can see the failure rate, you can do filtering. Um, I'm not gonna do a real demo here again, but the summary is we have tools. So you may be thinking right now, and this is a common reaction before people see, this is too simple, you won't find any bugs. Um, so let's test some state-of-the-art models from 2020. So for sentiment analysis, we did Twitter sentiment analysis. The reason we did Twitter was because a bunch of commercial models all use Twitter as a use case. So we're not just testing research models here, we're testing Google's, Microsoft's, and Amazon's model for sentiment analysis. And they all say it should work on Twitter, so we're using Twitter. We also tested research models, not trained on Twitter at all, but trained on movie reviews, um, and we wrote a bunch of tests for this. So here's our full matrix. I'm just gonna show you a few examples of tests just so you get a flavor for the kinds of things that we did in the paper, um, but also the kinds of things that I think people should be doing and can do with minimal effort. So here's an, a little more complicated test, an invariant test for vocabulary. Um, we're replacing neutral words, sentiment neutral words, with other sentiment neutral words with word. So basically we're saying, whenever you see the, that, and so on, look at the top um, field ends from word and replace it with that, with certain filters so you don't get um, weird stuff. And expect prediction to remain the same. So if you have the nightmare continues, our nightmare continues, should have the same prediction and so on. And we generated 500 examples. They look really good for the most part. Like there's um, the error rate, like the, the case when you actually generate something that changes, it's very low. So this is the test error rate for different models, um, commercial and research models. And you see that for the simple test, Google model, the Google model changes its prediction 16% of the time for examples like these. Now this is, people already know about this, these models are not really robust, but it's just interesting to replicate that kind of analysis. 
So I, I told you about this test before where I'm just adding negative phrases and expecting prediction not to go up. And we're even being generous in saying it can go up by a little bit by 10% or something, just not more than that. Um, for a third of examples, Google um, becomes more positive when you add I hate you to the end or I abhor you and so on. So that's a bit surprising. In terms of robustness, um, we also like, if these models work on Twitter, they should be able to uh, handle random URLs or at um, signs. These are completely random, not adversarial at all. We're just measuring how often does prediction change if you add a random URL or mention. And these models are not robust at all. Even commercial models that you think would have um, some of these things built in, they're not robust to this kind of perturbation. So 25% of Amazon predictions change. Um, temporal awareness is a category. Um, for sentiment analysis, it might manifest like this. I used to hate this airline, now I like it. Um, and we have templates like this. Whenever I show one, you, you, can, you should imagine in your mind a bunch of um, similar examples. Um, so this is a little more complicated. You have to understand that if you have something in the past and in the present, the present really should be the right sentiment for the prediction. Failure rates are in the 40s for commercial models. Burton Roberts did reasonably well. Um, we did very simple negations, so negating a negative. It wasn't a lousy customer service. This wasn't bad. And I didn't mention, but this is three-way sentiment analysis, so predictions can be positive, neutral, or negative. And we're saying if you negate a negative, it shouldn't become positive or neutral. Or sorry, it should become, it should not be negative. It should become positive or neutral. So it wasn't bad, should not be labeled as negative. And failure rate is very high. Like these are very simple examples. Google gets more than 50% of these incorrectly. Um, which is kind of surprising. So it does have some bias in there. If you add negate, if you have a negation, it thinks it's negative, um, even if you negate a negative. Another form of negation is ending with negation. So this is a little more complicated, but it shouldn't be too hard. I thought this would be awful, but it wasn't. I thought I would um, hate this, but I didn't, and so on. Um, failure is 100%, for example, like this. So um, sentiment analysis is so in terms of semantic row labeling, we just change the, um, we, we put sentences in question answer form. So do I think this company is bad? No. So you have to be able to parse two sentences and understand that the negation is referring to that. But we also do yes. Do I think this company is bad? Yes, and so on. Taylor is almost 100% for all models, including Microsoft. I guess Burton Robert to do a little better. So these are simple examples. Like if we're trying to create sentiment analysis models that actually work, um, we need to be able to figure out how to handle these easy examples. And we have many more tests in the paper where they fail. Now we, we tested a different task. This is for a question pair. The task is to detect duplicate questions. So you have two questions on Quora. You want them to point to the same answer if they're duplicate. So they have this data set, that's a benchmark. Um, and we tested Bert and Roberta. We don't have a commercial model for this one. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at benchmarks, Bert and Roberta are supposed to be better than humans at solving this task in terms of accuracy. Um, let's see how they do. So very simple, if you have two questions, the simplest thing you can imagine testing is modifiers. So is such and such a teacher, is such and such an accredited teacher, is such and such a politician is such and such a person, a religious politician and so on. Those are different things if, depending on the modifier that you have there. And failure rate for this is 78% for both Burton and Roberta. So they predict that these are duplicate even if you have a modifier that changes um, the intent of the question. In terms of NER, we have this fun test where, oh, this one is not, not the one I was thinking about, but we just change, if you have two questions about the same entity, we change the name of the entity in one of the questions to another person, um, keeping the same. Um, if it's male, we, we change it to a male name. So is Donald Trump the Antichrist? Could John Green be the Antichrist? Should not be duplicates? Failure rate is about a third for Burton over time. No way that a human would make this mistake. Um, this one is a little more fun. We take a question, we look at the entities, and we just fill in between the entities with Bert. So if you, if you have, will it be difficult to get a U.S. visa if Donald Trump gets elected? Bert creates a question that says, will the U.S. accept Donald Trump? What was the requirement, what are the requirements for selection to MIT becomes what was MIT? And these overwhelmingly come out as non-duplicates um, if you do this procedure for long questions. And we're saying, how often does the model think it's still duplicates? So it's about 30% of the time, both Bert and Roberta seem to just 
narrow in on the entity and say it's the same thing. In terms of temporal awareness, it's a very simple thing. Is before the same thing as after? So we have a bunch of examples like this. Is it unhealthy to eat before or after 10 p.m.? Um, is it good to do such and such before or after 5 p.m. and so on? And failure rate for bird is 98%. You'd expect that the model would be able to figure out that these are not duplicate. Even Roberta is about a third. SRL, we just did very simple active and passive swaps um, with the same semantics. So this Anna love Benjamin is Benjamin love by Anna. Um, this should be duplicates, it's the same thing. Failure rate is 65 and 98%. So you can't really figure this out. And if you do different semantics, so if you change the subject and object, um, it also fails like 100%. Um, so you basically cannot figure out even very simple examples. Um, so even though the claim is superhuman performance, very simple testing shows that it's not. And again, we have much more in the paper. And lastly, we tested squad. Um, we just tested BERT in this case. It's also supposed to be better than human performance in terms of F1. And I'm just going to show you very simple MFTs. Um, it's, a little, it's a little harder to write perturbation test for this. So basic properties. First line is the context, so context in question. So the context is there's a large pink bed, and the question is what size is the bed? We expect the prediction to be large, and BERT predicts pink on examples like these 82% of the time. And if we have very simple context, Person one is more something than person two, and then we ask the antonym. We're using WordNet here to create this test. So it is 100%, um, so it never gets this right. In terms of um, temporal awareness, again, before and after, last and first. So Logan became a farmer before Danielle did. Who became a farmer last? Bert gets this wrong 83% of the time. Very simple negation. The simplest negations you can think of in context and question. Context, Aaron is not a writer, Rebecca is. Who is a writer? You expect the model to say Rebecca. Um, Bert thinks it's Aaron two thirds of the time. This is very, very easy. Like if you, if, you, if you have a model that is doing reading comprehension, you should be able to comprehend this stuff. Um, if you have Aaron is an editor, Mark is an actor, and you ask who is not an actor, it should be Aaron. Bert always gets this wrong, 100% um, of the time. So in terms of fairness, um, I guess we have a, a test that where we're checking if the test I just mentioned makes selective mistakes. Um, so if you have man is not a doctor, woman is, the model gets it wrong 93% of the time. But if you switch it around so that the woman um, is not the doctor, the man is a doctor, the model always gets it right, basically. But if you switch doctor to secretary, then it never thinks that the man is a secretary and often thinks that the woman is a secretary. So it's not just that it can't really figure out negation, it, it does so selectively depending on what you have there. In terms of co-reference, if you have reading comprehension, you should be able to handle simple co-references. Like Melissa and Antonio are friends, he's a journalist, she's an advisor. You just have to resolve um, the he and the she. Or actually in this case, just the he to Antonio, and Bert gets this wrong 100% of the time. Very simple agent object. So, Christian punched Nicole, who was punched? I think my three-year-old can figure this one out, but Bert gets it wrong 60% of the time. He cannot handle um, passive active very well. So what did we learn here? We're using the same process. Um, so basically we're trying to follow that matrix and we detected bugs in very different tasks and models. Another thing we learned, I guess maybe it's not a surprise to people here, but it was surprising to me how state-of-the-art models display so many bugs. Even commercial models, you think that they, they would do this kind of testing, but they, they have many significant failures. And I think that many of those bugs are not known, at least not at this scale, um, but I don't know. So you may be thinking, oh, I think we have a question in the chat. Let me read. Would using the examples from checklists as training data, let me, let me punt on that question. Um, I'll, I'll answer it later. I'll come back to it. So right now, how hard is it to find these bugs? You may be thinking, oh, maybe you just found these bugs because you're very good at finding bugs at, in models and so on. Um, so I actually wanted to figure out if it's just us, the authors of this paper, or if the process really works. So one thing we did was a case study. I went to the team at Microsoft that trained that sentiment analysis model that I was testing. And I asked him, hey, what do you guys do as far as testing? Like, how do you guys um, validate this stuff? 
And the model is actually pretty stress tested. Like they have multiple benchmarks. They have customer complaints that they didn't add as tests. Um, they had in-house data sets, like they had a data set just for negation. So they were doing extensive testing. We, we ran a, se a session with them anyway, um, five hour session where they're trying to follow the checklist process. So they're looking at the matrix and trying to create tests. And with just five hours, this is a model that they, they have been developing for a while and it has a lot of customers and stuff, but they're still able to find many new bugs in only five hours. So they tested new capabilities. They tested stuff that they were testing before, but they tested it better. Like negation, for example, they found a bunch of bugs, even though they had a bunch of negation data sets. It really makes a difference if you sit down and try to isolate behaviors and write tests for them, you find bugs. Um, so they're very happy to run that. And we were happy that even for a model that people had been testing extensively, following this process really helped. Um, we also did a user study um, so this is this is with people who are not experts. So people are testing BERT on QQP, and none of the participants except for one had experience on QQP. So we have three conditions here. Um, one, we just tell them, hey, take the next two hours and test this model. Do whatever you want. Here's a Jupyter notebook. Here's access to the model. Figure out if this model is working. Write tests. Um, use whatever you want. The other two conditions. One, we told them what to test, so we said, hey, try testing negation, try testing core reference, and we explained what those things are. So basically we gave them the matrix, and in the last condition we gave them a bit of tooling, so we gave them templates and so on. So in these conditions, people with checklists created way more tests. It doesn't mean that the tests are better, but it's just easier for people to write tests um, if you give them some direction of what they should be testing. They also created way more test cases for tests. So given a single test, if you have to write examples by hand, it takes a while. If you have tooling like templates, you, you create way more. But more importantly, we measure how many bugs they found. This is self-reported. Um, they're reporting the number of significant bugs that they found. Um, and we also measure severity and stuff. But we had an independent rater also rate stuff. Anyway, it's subjective, but people think that they found way more bugs and independent raters agree with checklists in the same amount of time. So there were more tests, more coverage, and more bugs. And they found the same bugs that we found. So I could have written a paper and put in the paper only the bugs that people in the user study found and would have been fine. So it's just a matter of looking for them. The bugs are there, easy to find. So I wrote this paper a little while ago. Um, we got some traction. At Microsoft, um, I've seen the, the following reaction to checklists. I go to a team and say, hey, have you tried testing your model? And they're, Typically, I met with skepticism. They're like, oh, yeah, you have these examples in your paper, but it's not going to work because my model is a snowflake or my task is very different. And there's no way you can write tests. So the first few times that that happened, what I did was I went ahead and wrote tests for their model and used their model and then found a bunch of bugs very quickly. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I guess you can do it. And then people adopted. Um, so I found, like, and people have found, like, I've, I've had reports of people using this, even more state-of-the-art models. Um, it's, not, it's not just the ones in the paper. We, we test the translation. We test a bunch of stuff. Um, but figure out that a lot of things need improvement. So we need more guidance. Like, I can't expect the users of this thing to go and read my paper. And we also need more building blocks. So right now, what we do is we say, hey, here's a matrix. You should try testing this stuff. And it's easier than not having anything, but it's still kind of hard. So I've been working on making this even easier to use and something like I want this to be like unit test where people use this. If you have an NLP product, you should be testing it. Um, and there's no reason why you shouldn't test it with this stuff. So in summary, if you take one thing away from this talk, you should test NLP models, like um, either by hand using checklists or whatever. I guess you guys are linguists. I don't need to convince you that you can't just take a test set and say, 95% accuracy, this is great, it's better than humans. You should actually go and test behaviors and so on. And we're trying to borrow insights from software engineering. So I think those insights served as well. We're telling people what to test, how to test, and we're giving them a bunch of tooling, and all of those seem to help quite a bit. You can try it out, it's open source. Um, I am maintaining it. Um, I actually, I just submitted a few papers to ACL and ICML, so I've, I've been kind of not working on this a lot, but. I'll be working quite a bit on improving this tooling. So 
you, you can also check out the paper. There's way more examples, and of course, I've summarized a bunch of stuff here. But that's all I got as far as checklists. That's actually all I got as far as the talk. Um, so I had those two parts aired out in checklists. But I can take questions either on checklists or on anything else. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, if, um, I'm glad that we did get to see some fun examples uh, of bugs and errors in systems. There were a few questions in the chat. And so, uh,